in Houston when I grew up, it was the Apollo space program. Energy was booming and Houston was just this amazing bundle of energy. It was just growth and expansion. And we lived in the country and I grew up riding horses and working cattle. So I felt like I always had the best of both worlds. In Houston, everything's flat. And I lived literally in the middle of the rice fields. So it would rain a lot, but then if it wouldn't rain, they'd flood the rice fields. <laughs> so it was always wet and muddy. And I never stayed inside. If, if the sun was up, I was outside have always been a part of my life and uh, always will be, especially horses. Well, I always thought I would be a horse trainer and I was, I was great. I would find horses that had, they were in bad, you know, bad trouble. Maybe they had the wrong owner. Maybe they were being abused, maybe neglected. Uh, maybe their owner was taking great care of them, but totally misunderstood them. So I had the barn of misfits. The worse the horse was, the more I wanted them. And so I had about 30, 38 horses. I taught riding lessons. And I thought that's what I was, I was doing what I was supposed to. I didn't know that that was just training for what I would really do. And about the time I was in my mid thirties, my life changed. I heard about a slave ship out in the ocean that had about 80 children destined for some horrible slave situation but I was so angry I mean just an anger I don't know that I'd ever felt before and I was angry for two reasons of course obviously who would do this to anyone much less children and then second I was mad because I was in no position to help and I was mad at myself that I was this age and that was happening and that I had kids that I didn't want to hand the world to where this existed and so that pushed me like a freight train back into college and I I started very soon after that at a junior college to complete my education which I had started years earlier. I started at Palo Alto Junior College which amazingly I totally ignored had an amazing art program but I had to walk by it every day so I, I can't dismiss now that must have had some influence on me. Then I go but I only have a bachelor's and I don't know that that'll get me where I wanted to go. So I immediately enrolled at St. Mary's University and I got um, into the International Relations Program of St. Mary's. And that's where I was meant to be. But while pursuing that degree, we had a speaker from the State Department come and she talked about the new laws back then, it was around 2002, 2003, to stop modern slavery, human trafficking. And I knew this is what I was supposed to do. Like all this journey had been for this moment for me to realize now I know what I'm gonna do. And I started the next day. I was sitting in that lecture with the woman from the State Department, Laura Letterer, who still works in this issue today. And I saw this fast forward, you know, like a flashback, but this was forward in time. And I saw helping victims, training law enforcement, media, TV, movies, news, law. Well, the next day there was a meeting and one of my professors gave me her seat. It was a closed meeting of all the leaders in our community with the uh, person from the State Department. From that meeting, there was all these ideas they wanted to carry out but had no ability to do so. So I raised my hand and said, I'll do it. And so I began hosting trainings and meetings and I built a coalition while I was a student at St. Mary's. And that coalition lives on today. Now I've been doing this uh, human trafficking thing for about 12 years. I've traveled throughout the United States and I come home and I'm kind of tired. And uh, I did some consulting work for the Heidi Search Center. They hired me to train their volunteers about human trafficking because they were seeing a lot of the missing teens were actually trafficked and they needed to know how do we handle this. The Heidi Search Center is really a part of this central, South Central Texas community, San Antonio and beyond. Because in 1990, Heidi Seaman went missing. And we all knew that story. The entire city of San Antonio stopped what they were doing and looked for Heidi. For the 27 years the Heidi Search Center has uh, operated, 
98% of its cases have been solved and 94% with the, the missing person found alive. Over the years, we've um, assisted in over 4,000 cases. For 15 years, I've done this and I've seen the worst humanity has to offer. And usually upon the most sweet and innocent victims that never, never should have been hurt or exploited or abused. And I believe I've been able to develop a, a, a protective layer so that I could do it. Because if I ever really stopped and let it hit me, I couldn't do it. 15 years is a long time. I'm probably probably getting to the to where that protective shield's getting a little thinner than it used to be. I never would have known the beauty in those things that we often all complain about. I never knew how special it was to know my daughter sleeping soundly in the next room and to go hear her little breath and know she's safe and content. Like we take those things for granted and I've had the joy of understanding how valuable each of those little moments are. So that probably also keeps me going. I was never an artist, which is so funny. I used to joke that I can't even draw my name. And about three or four years ago, I had a trafficked victim who wound up living with me with her two children. And her littlest daughter loved to draw. And so I went and bought supplies from an art school that was going out of business. And we all got down on the floor and drew with this little five-year-old. And then I found myself waking up at night when everyone was asleep and I started drawing. <laughs> and so it was a gift from that little child that uh, w awakened the artist within. I started with painting, then I did mixed media, and then I moved into jewelry, and then from jewelry I moved to photography. I started uh, posting the art, the jewelry, and then I moved into the flowers. And the flowers, that was, that was it. That is the thing that everyone could relate to that could brighten the dullest of days, that could spread joy without words or explanation. And so the flowers were where I stuck. And then when I took a few pieces to be framed, I was surprised as anyone when someone asked to buy them. Creating art for me became a compulsion. Uh, when I would get up and create at night, it was just like time stood still. So this is my favorite painting. And as you see, it has many, many layers of, of deep texture and surface and colors. And it has this meaning of, you know, sometimes our best moments come from when we were darkest. And you'll see it goes from dark to light and that the butterflies are freedom and overcoming changes in life. And I believe the message is why it's my favorite painting along with the colors and the texture. What I hope people get from my art is texture, color, and beauty. Our lives are so layered. You know, we're, we're, we're not polished smooth edges, any of us. So I enjoy taking that idea and putting it on canvas or in film. I think I'm gonna scale back my human trafficking activities and move into film and video. In all these 15 years, I've done an amazing amount of video for news or documentaries or um, you know 48 hours and um, you know these shows that came you know to learn about trafficking and I loved the people I met and I loved creating images which are to me more effective than words the film and video you can tell the story again back in those layers and so I want to find what that journey means and I want to keep telling these stories Honestly, I hope by the time I'm close to done that this man-made problem of human trafficking, it can be stopped. It's really not that difficult. We just need everyone to agree on it. And so I hope the images and the film and the love that I bring out through my art will push it in that direction. And I've seen the power of art. I think it's possible. Thank you.